Good afternoon and welcome to Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon Series. My name is Natalie Urquhart. I'm a curator and museum director at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. And this afternoon, I'll be in discussion with Susan Maines, a visual artist and gallerist from Grenada. Before we begin, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to the Catapult team for making this series of salons happen. The American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative and Fresh Milk. Please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section of the talk, and we'll get to those at the end of our discussion in the Q&A segment of the salon. And of course, subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel. So it's my great pleasure today to uh, introduce self-taught artist, Susan Maines, a Grenadian who grew up on the island and is four generations um, of Grenadians uh, on the island since 1950. For more than 30 years, Susan Maines has been pursuing the mystery of the Caribbean in her painting, writing, and now mixed media works. Her work has been exhibited in the Caribbean, Canada, USA, Germany, Australia, and China, and is collected internationally. I'll also be talking to Susan about her work as a, a gallerist. She first opened her own gallery in 2002, Art and Soul in Spiceland Mall, and recently opened a second space with her son, Asher Maines, also a visual artist, um, called Art House 473 in the village of Caliste in Grenada. Susan was recently awarded, very prestigiously, uh, the member of the British Empire Award for her long-standing service to the visual arts. Susan, it's a real pleasure to welcome you today. Hi, so thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be here with you and to be able to speak to the other artists of the Caribbean. Really it's happy. Been, it's been a wonderful um, it series. You know, it's one thing to follow. You know, we're, we're aware of the, a lot of the other people that have been participating in the salons, but to hear from artists, curators, storytellers, musicians directly, particularly in this moment, I think has been incredibly uplifting. It has um, been. It really has. And, and I think hopefully the start of many future collaborations and projects throughout. Um, yeah. So it's been great. And I'm just loving your background today because I'm thinking, wow, mine's looking a little bit dull. This is my museum director yes. background <laughs> I've got on. You've Those got your visual walls. artist. <laughs> if well, I, were I, to wanted, turn... I wanted to do this in my studio, but then I decided it was just too messy to show. So just a little painting on a wall. It's perfect. I'm cheating because on the other side of my desk, I have a lot of a lot of the, the books are the mess, but this is the neat side. Um, but it was great to briefly chat with you last week as well and kind of prep up this session. Um, but I'm really interested to, to kick off today um, because your, your journey in a way has been like many, many of us in the region. Uh, we might be drawn to wanting to pursue a career in the arts, but often told as young people that we need to go and find a more sensible job and end up finding ourselves at university studying everything but the creative um, sector. And I work a lot with young people in the Cayman Islands to try and kind of uh, sort of use examples of people like myself in what we call, uh, you know, proper real, real jobs in the creative sector. I mean, the, it, it can happen in our countries and use these examples to showcase to parents that, that uh, more and more be supported in these creative careers. So I, I, I'd love to start today by hearing about your own journey. You know, you went you went in a sensible direction and then came back to the real world of the arts. Yes. And tell us about that. I had always loved art from the time I was a child. All through my teenage years, I painted little amateur stories about uh, life in Grenada. And when it was time to go to university, I told my parents, I want to go to art school. And they said, don't be silly. And so I went off to university in the States. I did a first degree in sciences, and then I went on to pursue um, education. I have a master's and a doctorate in education. Um, but it was while I was living in Dominica for a few years. You know, we had a little re uh, revolution in Grenada, and my husband and myself ran away for a bit, and we lived in Dominica. And it was while I was there, I was doing my little amateur paintings at home, and a young Dominican artist, a teenager at the time, he came home and he says, you know, you could do much better than this. And, you know, some people would have been put off by that and taken right. it as an insult. But uh, I took it as a challenge and I said, show me how. And 
he started criticizing my work. So when I say I'm a self-taught artist, it means I didn't go to university or art school, but I have been taught. I've been taught by other artists, by traveling and going to museums when I can. And now by seeing so much available on the internet that you can really scan the world of art so, um, and then, you know, as far as the rest of it goes, moved back to Grenada in 1992. At that time, there were a couple of galleries, Yellow Pui Gallery and Art Grenada. Uh, over the years, I just found, even though I was selling well, because my commercial work has an appeal to visitors and visitors were one of my primary market sources. Um, I wanted more than that. I wanted a contemporary expression. And so that sort of motivated me to start my own gallery and use it as a platform for mentoring young artists. And I think that's, you know, just the, the, the longevity of your space um, speaks so much to, I would say, the diversity of what you're you're doing. Um, I know in my own country, and Cayman is probably this, one of the smallest islands in the in the whole of the Caribbean. Um, you know, contemporary galleries have struggled. The, the ones that have have remained um, are the more uh, tourism driven type galleries, and I think your your focus is probably broad enough to 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 manage both sides of that. But I think you know we all know the energy that's that needs to go into keeping these kind of spaces propped up um, when the art ecology or the community is, is much smaller. Yeah, and um, I have to say for the contemporary side, um, we don't get any grants, we don't get any support from government or anywhere outside. You know, this is um, amazing what Catapult has done because, you know, and painting for 30, 35 years, this is the first time I have received a grant to be able to do something. So it's really amazing. That's fantastic. And, and you know, I think, as you say, what Catapult's doing um, in a journey of other um, art happenings like Tilting Axis has been going strong for a few years, um, has some of the same partners like Fresh Milk. And it's just opening up the possibilities, I think, of these networks and exchanges and collaborations. Right. But none of that functions, as you say, um, well, it functions, but with a lot of sweat and, and tears, um, and to have the addition of um, being recognized formally with a grant, I think is is one of the remarkable aspects of Catapult, and so necessary in, in this moment when artists are struggling across yeah. the, the world and, and yeah. across the Caribbean as well. And we'll get later on in the presentation, I want to talk about obviously lockdown and moving uh, moving forward and, and what that looks like in terms of different ways of engaging and how you guys have been innovating. Mm -hmm. um, but before we do that, let's talk about your art artistic practice so we don't, we don't miss that part. I'm very, very excited to hear more about that. Before we move into what you've been doing recently, um, tell me a little bit about your, your own focus over the years in your, your practice. Um, well, I've, I've, well I've, I've just read one thing that really stood out to me when I was reading through your your bio, um, and you describe your work as an exploration of gender, culture, and relationships of the Caribbean within the Caribbean. And I noticed that a lot of your work is landscape-based, so you really explore that um, very much in a, a, a sense of space. Um, so yeah, tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some people look at my work that is the more commercial work, meaning that it sells easier. And they so it's just pretty pictures. But if they're just seeing pretty pictures, it means they don't know quite enough yet. And um, part of it is an education process. I talk about the way I paint. I paint in layers. And um, just like I paint in layers, our culture is very layered. You hear one side of a story and you think that's the truth. Then you hear the other side of the story and you say, oh, that must be the truth. Then you heard a third side of the same story. And somewhere in the midst is that intangible truth that only reveals itself if you're willing to sit down and listen and to watch and to spend some time with it. And a lot of my paintings, this is the way they are. It might look like a landscape, but there's cues and hints in it. Um, one of my favorite views is the one from my home, um, looking across at Morongozo in St. Paul's. And before we had our hurricane in 2004, there were little wooden houses across that hillside. And 
the nutmeg trees had grown very tall, which means they weren't being cared for properly because a nutmeg tree in order for it to produce has to be trimmed every year. And so a, a rounded nutmeg tree is a productive nutmeg tree. So when you see my paintings with the little houses and these huge towering tall nutmeg trees, an insider would know somebody's not taking care of the essentials. So, you know, they're full of hints, full of stories, right. full of um, things that tell you about us. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, we struggle with sometimes in, in our museum sector here, when we're talking about using art as, a, as an educational prop or tool, is um, just how powerful those kind of stories can be in this visual, visual sense. Yes. Um, and a lot of what we're doing at the museum in our space is sort of reminding schools that, you know, you can use these props to yeah. to to point out that someone isn't maintaining those trees and, and how to maintain those trees and why it's so important. And, um, and it starts the conversation. Absolutely. And you do, um, I've, I've read a lot about the, the educational work that you've been doing through your space as well. Tell me a little bit more about that then. So your practice as an artist leading into that, but of course the gallery as well. Well, um, the new place that we have, Art House 473, uh, we opened in 2018 after paying years of rent for a bigger space in Spiceland Mall. We sort of added it up and we go, ah, we could have bought a building. And so we started looking around for a building to buy and we found a disused church. It hadn't been used in over 10 years. And we were able to purchase it with a mortgage and have made that into an educational space. And so we have room for classrooms, for exhibit. Uh, in the future, we would like to do residencies. Um, our programming, of course, is on halt for now, but in the future, we do hope to be able to um, use that again uh, for that education and that reach into the community and the international community. So that's almost like having a, a hybrid model of the nonprofit education space and the commercial gallery. It's a yeah. really interesting model yeah. that is obviously working well and something that we should maybe look further at across the Caribbean. You know, in the Caribbean, we, we cannot depend on grants. We have to do something to generate enough money for us to make it work ourselves. We, you know, the grant makers aren't really looking at us. They, you know, I looked at so many after COVID and it said, you know, for this country or that country or this, you know, ethnicity or that, you know, and um, most of us in the Caribbean, we just don't qualify. We certainly have that challenge in our in our space because yeah. to add an even more complicated um, framework, obviously the Cayman Islands is still British territory, yeah. although, although sort of conceptually and certainly culturally is is very independent from that yeah yeah um so it is a, it is a it is a difficult uh um difficult system to navigate um and we've been trying to get past that by collaborating with with different countries and different organizations which That's which works well and mm -hmm. i i read as well you know a very dear friend of mine and i would say mentor in many ways is rosie gordon wallace in miami mm -hmm. and diaspora vibe i think have yeah. come down and you've done has. exchanges She's, and collaborations mm -hmm. she has brought groups of artists to grenada and um i think grenada was the first place she came to on okay. an international exchange and then we have taken groups um up to miami to her space and how, um, because I do want to touch on some of the other international work you've done, you've been to the Venice Biennale, we're going to get to that. Um, I, I want to use this platform as well for some advocacy to say those, yeah. kind of I, I really believe myself, are invaluable. You yeah, know, we, they are. We have a thriving art scene in the Cayman Islands, but a lot of our artists haven't had the opportunity yet yeah. to go abroad or exhibit abroad. Um, and Miami's, you know, relatively close. I think one of the things that have been quite profound for some of our younger artists we've we've supported a couple on the caribbean linked um uh residency exchange that that fresh milk um and atelier uh 89 in, in aruba mm -hmm. have been doing mm -hmm. and you know they come back and just having access to other conversations and dialogues is is life-changing in many it ways is. it is I and mean, how we have to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves and how have you put that together from your space um, through the gallery 
um, the, the sort of collaborations? Is that something, again, you've sought private funding for? Yeah, and uh, private funding is sometimes me in my pocket from my sales of my paintings. Okay. So, yeah. Well, well big, big respect for that. And <laughs> thank you for it. Um, we, need, we need more pioneers like yourself doing that kind of, doing that kind of work. Um, we'll, we'll talk at, near the end about the sort of international work, because I think that fits really well into how we are evolving in this moment as well, both online and in the future um, in person. But I'd love to move into really looking at this project that we touched on in our earlier discussions, um, because I'm really fascinated about this, this body of work that was created in advance or at the beginning of lockdown, correct me, but that has really taken on a life of its own um, in the lockdown moments and yeah. really come to reflect this uh, life-changing time that we're all living in. And I think we actually have some video for this as well, don't we? So if we could get the first video up, Yeah, so um, this series of work are large. They're nine feet by 12 feet, and they're done on raw canvas. This first one was actually the first one that was created for the series. Um, I had planned to do a show in May at Art House, and I'd planned it big because finally we have the space to show really big work. And, um, you know, we locked down, and so did my brain. Um, so I had to really think about how the effects of being shut away from everybody, what effect it was having on our culture, because usually culture is transmitted in groups. It's transmitted by the time that you spend with others. And so there are several paintings. That first one was relationships, uh, dance, drumming, family, all of those things being affected by um, this very, I mean, it wasn't just the pandemic, it was also what was going on in the United States with the terrible inequities of race that were happening there with the death of um, the Floyd. George Floyd. Yeah, and um, the police yeah, response to it and the continued demonstrations. And here we sat so far away from it, but yet too, it affects us. And uh, the, just the tremendous sadness that you felt. My mother, who is 91 years old, lives in a care home in Texas, and she caught COVID. And she had it for five or six weeks. And wow. she also has uh, dementia, so she didn't remember why she was feeling so bad. But um, just a lot of stress and strain, just at dealing with the total lack of control. Absolutely nothing you could do to you know, affect any change for anyone, but sit inside your house. And so I sat in my studio and made this work. So if we could see the next slide, or the next video. Okay, this is the traditional, this was inspired by the traditional dance from Grenada, Bele, and which has its roots in Africa and France and Scotland and just everything that's Caribbean that comes together is found in this dance. Okay. And so I made it by picking up scraps in my studio. The skirt 
is um, pieces of strips of canvas that I put down um, that are sort of throwaways and I put down and I use it for a palette when I'm painting with acrylic paint. Okay. I and can so see that now in the pattern. Absolutely. Yeah, this is just a, you know, a conglomeration of paint on the palette. And then the pieces of um, the collars, just pieces of white cloth that are stitched together. And we didn't really get close enough to see, but that red thread that binds all of us. And if you go back into our history and you look at the meaning of red in red clothing and that red thread that is used in many uh, rituals and ceremonies. Um, so one of the ladies has a safety pin attached to the backside of her collar because a safety pin is also a protection for women. So, you know, it just has lots of meaning woven into it. And I didn't know until I hung it up that the breeze was going to blow the skirts like that. It's so that quite was remarkable. Really, yeah, that that's was a really cool. pleasant surprise. I was going to ask you about that, and yeah. um, I, I find it fascinating. Just be even before we get into the, the the details of the work, the the challenge of creativity in moments like lockdown. And I've spoken to a lot of artists in the last few months. Some have been more prolific than ever. Mm -hmm. Some have had complete creative block. Mm -hmm. So I'm really pleased to see that even after that moment of um, feeling helpless yeah. that you were then able to kind of challen ch channel that yeah. um, into this um, really sort of large site-specific work. I mean, it, it seems like there's three panels, there's am I right? Six all together. Six panels of yeah. that sort of scale. Yeah. Um, so it's a really monumental um, series exploring, as you said, with the dance, but also music, um, and those various cultural Drumming, traditions in this world. family, relationships, yeah. And I think that, um, you know, the way that it evolved from the original concept for it to really address this idea of connectivity and tradition and the passing on of traditions, and in this case, um, the challenge, challenges around um, the loss of tradition when yeah. you can't come together as a family or as a community. I, I know in my island a lot of culture is passed on one-to-one um, -one. it's through storytelling not much is written down Our right are shared they're not um, archived at all yet yeah um, so we really are at this moment of cultural crisis in many ways yeah. um, at the same time you know we've learned from creatives through catapults and even this conversation just how we can also look at ways of adapting and helping find solutions to those uh, challenges. So I think we have a couple of stills as well, don't we, to see the larger um, larger project, if we can bring those up on the screen. Um, yeah, so you just see the, um, the three ladies there. And as the progression, as you read it from right to left, there is less and less of the woman's body being shown, so that the one on the, well, would be on the, the right, um, she has no head, you know, her arms fade away and we lose pieces of ourselves. And you feel, you really do get the sense of that movement and dance as well. We can't see the moving skirts yeah. in the wind there, but it's, uh, it's really yeah. remarkable how you've captured that. Um, and I think as well, not seeing the whole body there, as you mentioned, yeah. also allows you to feel like you're sort of stepping in to the yeah. movement yourself and actually very much feeling part of it. And if we can move to the next image, I think we see the other, the other part of the conversation, which is the music. Okay, so this is the drumming. And drumming is still very much a part of uh, culture in Grenada. And um, there's been one particular gentleman, um, Livingston Nelson, who has for decades kept it alive and researched and, um, you know, I just have to tell a little story because it's so appropriate. Um, Asher, my son, who is also my colleague, studied in Africa. He studied in Ghana um, at the University of Ghana. And he um, learned with a drum master. And he was down on the beach one evening just drumming with some of the guys in Accra. And they asked him, do you know what you're playing? And he says, no, this is just a rhythm from home in Grenada. I don't know. What, it mean, what its meaning is or you know, its origin is just something I know. He says, everybody plays this. 
and it's true. It's a um, a beat that you hear children playing on their desks at school. And what they told him is that song is from Ghana. And I'm, we all know how it came here. We know how it was passed along. And it is, it is the welcome song for a king. And we had a king who was found on one of the ships just at the time that the British slave trade was ending. And the trade ended and there was a group of people left on a ship and one of, one, one of them was the king. And he came and resided in Grenada. So the welcome song for the king is something that has lasted in our culture and in our consciousness without even knowing its origin. So here we have a group of drummers and there's a child sitting on the edge and the side, but his hands are like below the drum. He's not drumming, his hands are like tied. And if we see the next um, still, we'll see him. We'll see him looking out at us and he's, you know, he's questioning, he's staring directly at us and around his head is a halo or a corona. And um, really, he's looking to us for answers. And what are we going to tell him? We can't tell him everything's going to be all right. We can't tell him you know, we know the answers because we don't. So again, the art opens the way for conversation. And it does. And even just talking about the, the drum beat there, you know, coming to, to Grenada through such trauma yeah. and then it's sort of intrinsically becoming part of contemporary culture so much so that you hear the music without really knowing the story and I think that really does touch on not just the, the challenges around loss of traditions and the passing on traditions with the pandemic but just how absolutely critical it is to unpack those stories and pass them on with true knowledge so yes. learning where the drum beat came from, passing yeah. that on to our children and ensuring that they're, they're, they're aware of the full story and the full progression of those cultural transitions. Um, made more so and more relevant today when we, we, we're, we're limited with the ways that we can do that. So it's a, it's a powerful work and zooming in, I think on this, this, this one child and uh, that sense of uh, uncertainty uh, as you said, looking for answers, um, and even at, you know, entire communities, we're feeling this as adults, um, and we need to steward it um, yeah. going forward so that the next generation, we mitigate the fallout from it as much as we possibly can. But I think it speaks to the pandemic, it speaks to the passing on of these traditions and our full histories, and not just the, the segmented histories that we have right. perhaps been taught in our own school systems as well, which fortunately are coming to the forefront now in the work that artists, museums, et cetera, are doing around the region. And I have to say that a lot of this has been preserved through the passion of artists. Uh, Livingston Nelson is a drummer, but he's a passionate person about culture and drumming. And his desire and his life is geared toward this. And these passionate people are those who carry it forward. How does it, um, I know we have challenges around, say, our traditional thatching um, in Cayman. So we're, we're um, very, very briefly, we are you know, in the sort of 60s and 70s when the financial sector started booming, everyone's heard of the Caymanlands in relation to finance. But right. until that point, we were very maritime based, very, very small society. Uh, in 1970, there were only 10,000 people in the Cayman Islands. And there's still only 70, so we're still very small comparatively. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the the challenges that we have now is this this massive globalization in a very small period is even trying to get young people excited and involved in those traditions. Yeah. So looking at ways of um, not only archiving and ensuring um, and this is where the artists do play such a critical role, the passing on of tradition, but energizing and motivating young people to want to learn how to weave. Mm -hmm. uh, weaving exactly. doesn't necessarily sort of scream as something that's super exciting to do if you're on Minecraft or you, you know, you're on your iPhone. Um, so looking at innovative ways to kind of rethink those traditions as well and keep them moving yeah. forward. 
um, is very much part of the to practice make, that we to have. make them cool and sexy again. Yeah, you know, I use the word people. sexy a lot actually, and people are like, "What?" I'm like, "Gotta yeah. be sexy." But I, it has been a very interesting journey for me as a curator. That's what I'm. Yeah, one of my focuses is that this bridge between traditional craft and contemporary art, and yeah. how we do we make it interesting and, and sexy now more than ever. Yeah, so absolutely. Tell me a bit. Uh, it was great to learn about how you've sort of channeled your anxiety and stress into this this really vibrant and, and monumental project it really is very large it definitely needs i can see it exhibited in sort of this historic site or a very large contemporary space um but what about the gallery itself what about the community how and where are you guys right now in terms of yeah. moving out of lockdown um how are you coping as an institution as well as an artist yeah these are very very hard times um you know, our, we have tiny amount of visitors, um, just no help from our institutions. Um, I did apply for a grant, you know, for my artists to be able to help them and essentially was told, well, you don't qualify. Um, so it's it has been very difficult. Um, the gallery I've had online for a good number of years, um, but, you know, there's also this huge caution that people aren't really buying much of anything right now except essentials. Um, you know, I hear that there's a huge upswing in the 1% of the 1% of art, who people who use art to move their money around. But that isn't really filtering down to small galleries in the Caribbean. Um, you know, we keep looking forward, we keep hoping. I mean, we cut our expenses as much as we can. Um, we don't do all of the things that we would usually do. We keep hoping for a change. We keep hoping, you know, we are constantly looking forward to say, well, maybe when we can have some income again from this or that. Um, but it has just been difficult. And have you been, you, you mentioned uh, the online component, because of course that's how a lot of museums, like my own as well, have pivoted to yeah. try and get a lot of our, um, our visual archives. We house the National Art Collection for the Cayman Islands, we've got that online. Yeah. Uh, I've been learning a lot, like even doing these yeah. live sessions has been an interesting learning curve, because I was a bit of a tech dinosaur before this moment. Um, but even, you know, the simpler tools, we've found, I also uh, work as a president of the Caribbean. So we've been talking a lot about digital access and also the challenges around digital access. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of families that don't have yeah. multiple tablets or, or laptops for learning or working or very, very, you know, big challenges around bandwidth and even connecting um, to yeah. the internet. So looking at different ways, whether it's a website and you guys have a really great website, it was really good to learn about what you're doing through that site. But also Instagram, yeah. social media. I think you've said that there's, you've had a you yourself have been uptaking in sharing your work and yeah. the work of your artists in Instagram. Yeah, have you know have used Instagram excessive excessively. Um, it's also kind of a rabbit hole you run down, and you can use up a lot of time, you know. And managing your time when there's nothing to do is really essential because you can you know go down lots of rabbit holes and at the end of the day you really haven't accomplished anything mm -hmm. so yeah challenges of challenges of our times i think that's a great question as well because you know you can go on instagram and tell yourself that you're doing visual research yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then which is great and yeah. i have learned a lot as well mm -hmm. but as you said sort of monitoring that because I spoke to someone a couple of days ago about Zoom uh, meetings because they're back in lockdown. We're relatively free in Cayman because the borders have been closed for a long time. But, um, you know, even Zoom is such an amazing tool in one way. But after five or six Zoom meetings, you're so drained. You don't want I to imagine. do it anymore. Yeah. And balancing that with your own creativity because, you know, that yeah. doesn't, it's not yeah. very conducive, the management of the gallery with your own practice. And I was, really interested to talk to you about that as well. You obviously have created a good structure for yourself to be able to put the, the sort of business hat on and manage other people's creativity, which is what I'm doing, and then also create the work. Um, yeah. I have yeah. 
big respect for that because it's two different sides of the brain and uh, they're at war with each other sometimes. So you, you've obviously found a, a good middle ground. <laughs> well, I have so, a team, team of people who help me. Good. We all need we all need good teams ultimately, and I think we found that in this moment more than ever. You yeah. know, working, collaborating, yeah. expanding those teams. Uh, I think that's been one of the really important takeaways for me, um, not just with my own my own staff, but with um, artists, colleagues, uh, new colleagues like yourself from around the region. It's yeah. really yeah. making it bearable. Um, but the sort of what next as well. So we're in this moment. We are coming through through lockdown, and I, I do want to just remind everyone we're, we're going to be moving into Q and A relatively soon. So if you do have questions, please put them in the comment box. You can add those at any point. Um, you know, we're, it's really too soon to make plans in some ways and and kind of understand what twenty twenty one is going to look like. I've been hearing on the news about you know vaccines suddenly coming to the forefront, but there's a lot of questions around those and also when we as small island nations will be receiving those. Um, you know, most of us rely on tourism, so having those borders opened is is so critical to getting yep. back up and running in terms of galleries and art yep. sales, music, um, events and concerts, etc. cetera. Um, so what are you thinking is gonna be happening in the next maybe six months to a year for your space? Um, um, I just don't know. I'm afraid to plan anything. That's the truth. You know, I'm afraid I don't want to start, you know, with my whole regular yearly schedule and say, oh, that one's canceled. That one's canceled. That right. one's canceled. So right now I'm just trying to be fluid and flexible. Um, we're looking at some overseas possibilities. Um, we can, you know, we still have shipping. We can ship work out even if we, as people don't want to or can't go. You know, so work can be seen, you know, video work. Uh, we have some of our artists applying for a video uh, exhibition in Cuba. Um, you know, we just have to look at what is available and try to use it. For my think, own space, it's just, yeah. you know, I just don't know. Well, but that's, I think that's a really great um, approach because you've already had um, experience in history. I know you, you guys have been at the Venice Biennale, I think yeah. three times now. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is, you know, a remarkable achievement in its own right. And we need a whole other session to really unpack the complications of getting there, applying. Uh, and I do want to learn more about that from you. Um, <laughs> but already having that sort of uh, international kind of viewpoint, yeah. um, which we all hope to seek, but sometimes struggle with in our spaces. The mechanism, um, yeah. Yeah, the mechanism of how to the, get there. Yeah. Um, and in some of the institutions that the national agenda versus the international agenda. But really, if we want to provide opportunities for our artists across the region, we have to be seeking those yeah. international platforms. Absolutely. Um, in many ways, though, this moment and the digitization of the moment mm -hmm. should be offering some exciting new opportunities. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that some of your artists are already taking advantage yeah. of that. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. And have you found that your own audience through the Instagram posts, through the website in the in the moment has helped kind of expand those audiences as well? Have you I seen would like uptick? to I would like to think so. Yeah. So one of the positives potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Because um, yeah. we have to find those positives, don't we? There's there's so we have to keep keep looking, looking for them. Mm -hmm. Um well I'm excited to see what next. Now, I think one of the great opportunities that Catapult has sort of brought to the the forefront is these opportunities for certainly digital collaboration to start with, um, you know, learning about the artists that are doing the virtual residencies is a fantastic uh, project as well, and something that would be great um, for artists around the world to to continue exchanging that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but I know we have some questions uh, on the uh, the uh, comments. I have a couple more, but I don't want to uh, to miss some of these as well. So I'm going to um, to kind of read these some of just very big hellos as well great to see rosie in the audience there so oh, hi rosie and rosie um yeah so we've got susan um the whole saying incredible work susan uh greetings from uh susan wilzak from benton harbor um and so yeah they're just really really great comments so i have a couple more questions while we wait and see if anyone does have a question you know, I think what the moment brings, and I think something we've already started discussing, 
is just how cool. um, advocacy, understanding of what the visual arts are or, or the arts in the wider sense. And I know this is something we all struggle with um, across the region. And yeah. I've had so many conversations with people like Anna Lee, uh, Davis from Fresh Milk, um, whether that's underneath the, the Tilting Access gatherings that we've had for the last few years or through one-on-one -on -one projects with the Museums Association. In lockdown, it was, it was a really interesting um, moment. I applied for an essential worker permit when we went into lockdown to say, our museum is responsible for the National Art Collection. I have to go in several times a week just to check that the art's okay. Denied. Yeah. And again, <laughs> went to appeal, denied, mm -hmm. not essential. It's locked up, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were doing a lot, of, a lot of work on our digital platform, so from an audience engagement, that was fine. But we had to go to a second appeal, really kind of explain why being the custodian of this national art collection is, is is rather essential. So it's really opened up to me this idea of maybe trying to come together um, as art spaces to look at some way of of maybe a more unified um, way of advocating um, to the decision makers, whether that's through an association, whether that's just a more of an organic coming together, whether that is something that would be useful in Grenada as well, or what's happening in Grenada in terms of advocacy yeah. and visibility? In, in terms of archives generally, I don't even, yes. it is so sadly, sadly misunderstood and lacking in taking care of our vital records even. So that's a bigger conversation than we can have here. But absolutely any of those paths, any of those paths through organized um, and CARICOM, should be a body that could be appealed to um, the small, you know, connections, groupings, anybody, anywhere where we can talk about it is going to be a positive um, thing for preserving the Caribbean art that we do have. You know, I mean, global climate change. I mean, we've been just wiped Absolutely. out by hurricanes. Absolutely. And we need to, you know, plan for our future. We don't need to just let the future keep happening to us. And even the challenges of, of that disaster management training when you're on lockdown, yeah. it's one thing to do that virtually. Yeah. But even with my Mac work, we've had to put a couple of um, uh, big training sessions in the French Caribbean on hold. But we're still yeah. in the middle of the hurricane season and that doesn't stop because of COVID, does it? It right. just complicates right. things even further. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, Susan, can you tell us more about your relationships with galleries and artists around the region? Do you have any observations about cross-cultural intra-Caribbean through your work? And I know you've done some of this. Um, yeah. So tell us a bit more about that. Okay, so um, I have galleries in Barbados who represent me and Barbados has just been very, very good to me. Barbados has carried me when there's nothing else going on. So big shout out to art collectors from Barbados. Um, our, I have said this to all the powers that be every time I can. The biggest challenge to art developing across the region is our governmental customs and duties and VAT and permissions. And it is so difficult and expensive to send a piece of artwork to another Caribbean destination. It's just ridiculous. I mean, especially after you visit Europe and you see how easy it is to travel from one country in Europe to another. And it this, you know, because it's a union, it's the you know, European Union. And we have in CARICOM a grouping of islands that are supposed to be financially unified, but we're not. And until this is sorted, all the talk is just going to be talk because every little walking ground god in a customs office is going to want to stop that package and charge you a big set of money to let it pass. Yeah. So there has to be from the top go down, there has to be a mandate. If art, I mean, performers have the same issues. Um, maybe spoken word poets and poets aren't as suffering because people don't know what they do. You know, <laughs> they're not really sure. But um, this, is, this is just the monumental hurdle. And so, you know, 
can't say more about that until we sort that out. And again, we have to get our leaders on board. Exactly. I was going to say this is really another very important topic for that sort of advocacy mm-hmm. conversation, mm-hmm. universal sense. And it's one thing to advocate to your own government, but unless you're making those changes on yeah. a regional um, yeah. platform, it, it doesn't it doesn't change. Cayman, for example, it's a flat 22% to import art. It's the same percentage as a, as a couch, a car, a piece of fruit. <laughs> it's just yeah. the flat 22%. And that's yeah. even, as you say, getting it moving through customs and not getting it stuck for a month in a, yeah. a yeah. not a temperature controlled environment and uh, being concerned about those aspects as well. Um, another quick question, because, again, that's almost a, a great panel discussion in its own right. And I hope we can mm-hmm. reconnect on that. Um, Susan, this is from Annalie. Um, a big shout out to Annalie again for all the great work here. You mentioned that the Grenada Revolution is something that had been not spoken about enough in the Anglophone Caribbean. You can see this now in the screenshot. Um, the revolution being articulated by the art community. Um, this is a really good question. Um, a number of years ago, the Grenada Arts Council did an invitational and had about um, 30, 40 pieces of art that was done um, around the revolution theme. Um, we have artists who use it specifically to speak in areas of um, justice. Um, that's on YouTube. Um, you can find it, I think, under either Grenada Arts Council or under one of my channels on YouTube. Um, there has been a, there have been books, a lot of books that have been written. You know, now it's all these years later. And people are just now starting to tell their stories. And a lot of that is coming through in art. The new book that just out that is just out by Laurie Lambert um, about women's uh, influence in the revolution. So yeah, there's a lot more material coming. I think maybe the reason it wasn't talked about so much, particularly from Grenada, is that people were so hurt that they just couldn't bear to revisit that hurt. And um, there's been other work done um, on monuments, how what the monuments of the um, revolution have been. So yeah, it's it, there's a lot of written work. There's some uh, literature, there's some visual art. Uh, but again, I think I just think our platform needs to be bigger so people can see it. Well, it's great to know that that's really starting to take the forefront yeah. and people are beginning to address and unpack those histories. And there was yeah. a really great, um, not in relation to Grenada, but in terms of discussions around the current moment and monuments um, and revisiting those monuments. Obviously, there's so much going on across the region. Um, Shani Roper at the UE yeah. Museum in Jamaica did a really great Anyone out there, I would definitely recommend you connect uh, to Shani's work, which is online um, around this discussion. And Tara Innes Barbados are doing some great dialogue yeah. around this as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have some good colleagues in, in Martinique. Um, Matt hosted a conference there last year, for our first bilingual one for many years. And again, uh, doing some great work in that area. So I'm going to look out for for those um, publications, Susan. Um, I don't know a lot. I'll be honest about the history of Grenada. I'm very interested in in learning more. The revolution um, is one of those stories that has one truth and then another side of the story, then another side of the story and another. And the truth lies somewhere in the intangible. There is not just one story. Which loops back beautifully to the beginning of our conversation mm-hmm. and the way that your work tries to capture those nuances from multiple mm-hmm. viewpoints. And of course, we're all living in a moment, a global moment where those those facts and those, those realities are, are multi-layered and have multiple um, angles as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna go to one more question quickly here before we uh, wrap up and say our thank yous. Um, this is from Catherine Kennedy, also doing amazing work with Fresh Milk and this Catapult platform. So a big shout out to Catherine and Anne Lee. Um, Susan, many cultural practi- practitioners have to juggle multiple roles, which is something that you have navigated for many, many years now. Um, how do you balance the different kinds of work? And we touched briefly on that creative brain and the administrative brain. Um, obviously the team 
or the people that work with you do help mm -hmm. you regulate that. But this is from someone, Catherine, who I know is a artistic practitioner and an administrator. So give us some I, advice. I have to say, you know, I didn't go to art school. Um, I my first undergraduate work was in science. As I know, Rosie Gordon Wallace, her first area was science as well. And the study of science teaches you a lot about how to um, use your left brain. Um, so I would say that everything that I learned all along the way have contributed to the ability to juggle all of these things. And it, you know, you just have to cut out time for focus on the task at hand at this moment, and then you move to your creative practice, then you move to something else. It's just, it's just life. And, you know, we, we mentioned briefly that that's becoming, in a way, was becoming more challenging in lockdown, because I think what this moment is also teaching us is, you know, maybe we want to shift the way that we, we've yeah. done things historically. Certainly, you know, I, I um, work is, is, is my life, takes up everything it's 24 7 I love what I do but I realized I gave myself very little downtime from that yeah because if you if you love creativity and you also work in the arts there's not a lot of room outside of that for something yeah. you know yeah. completely different um, One thing, and that, um I had said to you before and I think it's important to reiterate is that we in the Caribbean we don't have institutions that tell us how to do things we don't have prescribed ways of going so often we're like breaking bush to make a path for ourselves. And I think in this new time and a new way of doing things, maybe we're um, particularly skilled and gifted to somehow maneuver in this new era. I think that's a fantastic observation. You're absolutely right. We've had to adapt for centuries. Uh, yeah. We've had to adapt individually. Um, if we are like I am in an institution, but it's a very uh, yeah. anti, an untraditional institution, yeah. um, and that has made us nimble and able to sort of yeah. continue to out of of need. And um, to shift I think when we need to to shift absolutely. So looking at this moment, maybe we come to it with more tools than a lot of our colleagues around the world. Yeah, and I think absolutely. That, uh, this platform alone is a great um, example of that. It is. You know, how do you? get past this idea of being isolated and bringing people together. And it's a really natural development of, of many years of, of talking about the limitations of connectivity in the Caribbean due to many of the things you pointed out, customs, shipping routes. If yeah. I want to ship anything out of Cayman, it goes to Miami and then yeah. comes back down to yeah. Grenada or Barbados or even Jamaica, who's only 80 miles from our yeah. little island. Um, it's crazy. And I think, I would love to continue with all of the people that are that are out there today, Annalie, Rosie, Susan. Um, we, we need to continue committing to this conversation about how we can together shift shift that and make this change. We're forward. really good um, pirates is what we are. <laughs> Cayman has a long history of, yes, putting that forefront out. So uh, <laughs> we can certainly learn from those forefathers, even if we... Uh, <laughs> maybe want to repackage it for the 21st century <laughs> in many, many ways. Um, I think we're getting very close to, to time. Um, Susan, I'd love to invite you to, to sort of sum up um, not only being part of Catapult, but uh, your practice, the moment that we're finding ourselves in, a couple of words of wisdom, even if we're not quite sure what that future is going to look like. Um, so over to you. Um, I would just like to say we didn't talk much about the Biennale, but I would what I would like to say to any of the artists or curators who are watching is it's possible. I, you know, I went as, as a just complete innocent, but I found people along the way who are willing to help me. And I am very willing. Anybody who has questions or want to know uh, where to start on the map, I am very willing to point the direction. Um, I would say that sometimes we in the Caribbean, we think a little bit too much of ourselves and we think of ourselves as being so advanced and independent. The bottom line is we need each other. We need other artists, other organizations to help us to show us the way. And I have found some of those organizations and you know, I am willing to share what I've learned with anybody who wants to make the effort. Um, 
I've had a couple of artists say to me over the years um, about organizing. Why should I get my hands dirty for someone else? And the answer is when you get your hands dirty for someone else, you lift yourself up so much. It's really worth the effort for if you have the ability to do the work and not wait, it's never going to come to you. Nobody's going to come and put it in your lap. You have to be the one willing to do the hard work of making it happen. So, yeah, so I just would like to say that I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with Natalie and with all of you and to thank Fresh Milk, especially for this fantastic opportunity and the American Friends of Jamaica and Kingston Creative. Um, this just, just um, couldn't have been better. So really a whole lot of appreciation for what you're doing. Well, and Susan, I, I want to reiterate this idea of um, giving, because if we can take anything away from this, this moment, whether that's giving um, or sharing food with our neighbours or with our communities, yeah. really in the heart of lockdown and what that's meant in terms of um, opening doors and, and reaching out, um, I think we are pushing that back to the forefront. And I think this is a moment that we can take that forward in a much more visible way than we have maybe for the last year. Yeah. You know, we've all come through systems in the region at times when people hold on to their knowledge yeah. and really don't want to open those doors. Rightly so in some cases for fear of losing jobs or not having maybe the one cultural job that's available um or, or or losing it because they're passing on knowledge but of course we can't we can't function that way and it's a very lonely path if we're going to function that way yeah um we briefly touched on in our last meeting together about secession planning and the next generation of cultural leaders you know they're in in, in absolutely critical to the work that you're doing now to be able to pass that on so yeah. if we can take anything away from this moment it really is um the sharing of knowledge the collaborative models, the coming together, um, putting our energy behind, um, making some of those differences at a leadership and advocacy level as well, something yeah. we should definitely reconnect on. And I'll tell you about Venice because I would love your inputs, even though yeah. my country is not a country and doesn't technically qualify. I still have an issue with that, but we'll get around it too. Um, but this All has been of money. Well, that's the next big question. So I might have to push it back a couple of years while that stays local and then we'll build out again, maybe yeah. together. Um, but I want to say a very, very big thank you to, we had a couple more questions from Rosie. We didn't get to those, the um, concept of post-blackness in Grenada. We'll continue talking offline with Rosie on that. Again, Rosie says, biennial, huge success. Thank you for your leadership, Susan. And uh, really a wonderful outpouring of support in our comments section there. But again, a huge thank you from me and Susan um, to follow Susan's thanks to the Catapult team, Kingston Creative, American Friends of Jamaica and Fresh Milk, Annalie and uh, Catherine are online with us today. So big shout out to them as individuals too. Do tune in again this afternoon. I'm going to be talking with Nicholas Rose a contemporary artist from Jamaica. Very excited to uh, have some dialogue with Nicholas this afternoon. And just a very, very big thank you to you, our audience as well, for tuning in to another session of the virtual salon uh, in lockdown by the Catapult team. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.